right, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, thanks for uh, hanging for the second of uh, four panels this afternoon. I'm Walt Davis, the Quad A Treasurer. It's a, an honor for me to be up here with these great leaders again to uh, have a discussion amongst our great program managers and TRADOC capability managers for what they're doing. So there's two panels that we have uh, back to back. So started with the attack UAS uh, panel to, to discuss. I've also got soft, but first uh, Paul Cravey, who's the TRADOC capability manager uh, for, he's got everything now. He's got recon, attack, and unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, Colonel Courtney Cody, who's the uh, PM for unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, the PM for uh, Apache is Tal Shepard. Uh, Colonel David Phillips, uh, Program Executive Officer for Aviation for Special Operations Command. And Ryan Coyle is the TRADOC Capability Manager for what I affectionately call the lint trap for all the stuff for the aviation brigades. And then, of course, Colonel Yong Lee has aircraft survivability equipment. Um, as a retiree now, you know, you don't have a lot of influence on, but I did ask them to talk about what's, what's going on in their lanes, what's important to them, what perhaps some of their challenges are. But uh, anyway, uh, again, appreciate the attendance, and I'm going to turn it over to Paul to talk about his area first. All right, I suppose you're wondering why I called you all here today. I didn't, but it's okay. Uh, as he said, I'm the uh, TRADOC Capability Manager for Reconnaissance and Attack Systems. Uh, that includes uh, all of our attack aircraft, uh, as well as our unmanned aircraft, so uh, Gray Eagles, Shadows, everything in that realm. And then also rolled under that is the, uh, the lethality for Army Aviation. So I, I not only have the, uh, the TICM responsibilities, but I have uh, three different personalities that I get to work with on a daily basis, being the, uh, the PM UAS, the PM attack, and uh, not up here today, Dave Warnick, which is uh, PM jams for the munitions. And uh, you know, a lot of the things for unmanned aircraft systems, which I did for a couple of years, pure away from this, uh, some of those requirements have shifted over to the Tickham Future Vertical Lift. So when you talk about an advanced UAS and an ICD that's pending approval for advanced UAS, uh, that now falls under TICM FVL, or correction, yeah, future vertical lift, under that CFT for the advanced UAS for teaming with that system there. Uh, and now we work mainly on requirements for the current systems that are in the field, as well as uh, support for that new experimental BCT UAS, which you may see come out, that's different from advanced UAS. Uh, on the Apache side of the house, uh, working with TAL's team, to meet the requirements that we have and fill some of our capability gaps. Uh, I'll only mention one, which is uh, we need to be able to see further than we do now so that we can do some long range engagements to meet some peer threats that are out there. So maybe a future opportunity for a new sensor for that platform or something that can aid that platform in seeing far enough to uh, give us the standoff we need to be more survivable. Uh, in the munitions side of the house, uh, near term, uh, lightweight precision munitions that everyone's aware of. RFI on the street, people are responding and people are bringing some munitions uh, to the forefront that double the number of stowed kills on a Gray Eagle in order to give commanders uh, more opportunity and more choices on the battlefield to prosecute the targets that they have with the longer station time that we're gaining from UAS across the force right now. And uh, also for munitions, a long range precision munition operational need statement uh, that's being validated that's out there now for the ability to be our part of the long range precision fire solution that the Army is looking for across the CFTs. Uh, so those are the few of the things that we're touching from a requirements lane in UAS attack and munitions. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to the smart guys to my left. Hi, good, good afternoon, Colonel Cody, PM for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. So uh, following on what Paul's been talking about, we're focused on on delivering capability, so a dedicated workforce of uh, 400 plus uh, folks sitting at Redstone Arsenal focused on one thing, and that's the soldier, and making sure that the soldier is enabled with combat capability in order to complete their mission. And we do that across 
multiple different echelons. And so we focus on delivering capability at echelon to the soldier. And we do that in accordance with the requirement documents that come out of Fort Rucker, but also in accordance with the dialogue we have with the operational commanders. So all the way down to the soldier level, the squad, the platoon with a small UAS and delivering the capability they need and demand at that level. The one system remote video terminal that allows the squad, company, and battalion to get the sensor feed at level three interoperability from the uh, shadow system and the Gray Eagle system, as well as the, all the small UAS that they employ at the uh, battalion below, as well as the shadow system, continuing to convert that from the V1 system to the V2 system and also improve its reliability, enhance its sensor capability and its ability to be more cooperative in the battle space from an interoperability and a man to man teaming perspective. On the Gray Eagle, we deliver that the division and echelon above division. The big, bold move right now with the Gray Eagle is introducing the extended range Gray Eagle. So doubling the endurance and increasing the payload capacity of that weapon system to deliver increased capability at echelons above division, but still continuing to deliver the Gray Eagle to the divisions right now. So finishing out the fielding of the shadow system, finishing out the fielding of the Gray Eagle system at the division level, and then cascading the extended range at the echelon above division and filling out the division gray eagles uh, and then also focusing on the reliability and increase our reli or lethality of those weapon systems hey, good afternoon uh tal shepherd pm apache uh if you were in some of the professional sessions this morning you hear that uh, uh army aviation the demand is not decreasing and that is certainly the case for the apache platform uh and that point solely drives our mission statement, which is to develop, uh, produce, field, and sustain the world's most lethal attack platform and support those that, that maintain it and fly it. Uh, so that's how I'll outline my opening comments is first with development. We're still in development for version six on the Apache Echo model. Uh, that version of ca capability is really the final official uh, capability insertion for the platform. Uh, as you heard from today from Major General Gaylor, the program is a remanufacture uh, program. So a, a old H-64 Delta is inducted into the line, parts are taken off it, uh, and then either reused or overhauled or not used again uh, for the Echo model fleet. So as we go through the development of that, we got to take into account um, maintainability of the platform, uh, reliability of the platform, survivability, and certainly affordability as we go through the development of version six. Now, uh, last year at Quad A, I'm sure we were talking about uh, FOTE occurring about right now. But w it is not happening right now. Uh, we have delayed FOTE uh, for a year into spring of 2019. And uh, one of the main reasons there is we, we weren't ready yet. Uh, so the, the year is going to get us ready. It's going to help us mature technology. And uh, also we're going to gain some efficiencies by uh, synchronizing our OT with the uh, JAGM uh, OT as well. So we minimize touches to force comm units for an operational test, and we uh, save some resources as well. Uh, production and fielding. Uh, Major General Gaylor mentioned it as well. Uh, we, are, uh, we, we insert technology incrementally into the Apache. The first insertion was uh, version one in 2012. Uh, we began fielding version four, which brought uh, Link 16, more joint interoperability, man-to-man -man teaming, uh, air video to the ground. Uh, into version four, we started fielding that in March of 2016 with our fifth unit equip. Um, we are currently fielding the eighth unit equip at Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, and something that uh, you might not see in our mission statement or in our core competencies of design, develop, deliver, but we also do new equipment training uh, out of our office uh, for echo model fielding. So what does that mean? It means the pilot and the maintainers don't have to leave their home station to go to the transition course. We show up uh, once the unit begins to field aircraft and we conduct the training. Uh, so we've been doing that since uh, 2011, 2012. Uh, and have trained over 900 pilots and over 1,000 operators, and we're continuing to do that. At the same time, we've been able to stand up a, a limited mobile training team to do the H-64 Delta transition as well at specified units, and we're having great success with that and uh, helping train uh, uh, Apache pilots. 
uh, sustain and support. We spend uh, a, a large amount of our time with the logisticians and our ACLC partner uh, with reliability of parts. We constantly track our reliability uh, uh, and, and, and the top offenders of the reliability, okay, right? And, and we, put, we identify it, and then we work with the OEM to put plans in place to, to rectify uh, uh, areas that are, that are overburdening the soldier, overburdening the unit, uh, so that we can be better. Now that's more difficult uh, with the remanufacture program, but we, we work that issue hard, and uh, my fleet management and customer support branch is a single belly button into our office, and if they can't answer a question, uh, they, they can get you who needs that question answered. But uh, a lot going on in the, uh, in the Apache community, uh, a lot of focus on reliability and reducing the uh, burden on the soldier. Uh, and trying to make the aircraft easier to maintain and easier to operate. Awesome. Good job, Tal. I think uh, from, the, from the perspective of a soft operations and soft ATNL down at PEO Rotor Wing, we're doing a lot of the very same things that Tal and the other PMs and, and TICMs are executing on a daily basis. Uh, I'm David Phillips. I'm the Rotor Wing PEO. I've been down there for about two years now. And in those two years, I've, I've noticed that we could not do the things we do at SOCOM if it weren't for the Army collaboration that we get on a daily basis. So that's why I, I look at the, the things that my fellow PMs and the, the TICMs are, are doing, and, and I feel closer in collaboration today than we've ever been, I think, on the SOCOM side. Um, so how are we getting after it in SOCOM, and how are we supporting the PMs that are actually supporting the users? Uh, we're, we're really looking at three things. We're looking at Readiness, number one, to support the current fight. We've got aircraft deployed. We've had high utilization rates on all our MH-47s, MH-60s, and Little Birds for the past 15 years. Those high utilization rates have taken a toll on the aircraft, and so we're recapitalizing two of our major platforms. This year, we're starting with the inductions in Lot 1 for our MH-47 fleet. That's very significant. It's a lot of work that guys have put in over this past five to 10 years to build up to where we're gonna recapitalize the entire fleet. And I'd say we could not execute that without the close collaboration we've had with PM Cargo. So that, that's one example of how we're collaborating with the Army. The second piece is really how we're working together on, on the sustainment side of the MH-60 fleet. So the MH-60 fleet that we fully fielded um, in 2015, we'd recapitalize that fleet with UH-60Ms. We took those aircraft, we, we applied some soft mods to them, and they've been fielded now for about two to three years, and we're just getting into the sustainment side of that effort where we're really in earnest working with, with AMCOM and AMC and, and PM Utility to be able to sustain those aircraft in the right way. Uh, the third effort really, and the, the other big recapitalization effort is the Little Bird Block 3 effort. We've got uh, aircraft that will be uh, inducted in the next two years. We're finishing up the development on that program bringing a lot of um, additional power margin to the aircraft, some obsolescence management. Uh, we're looking at new shells for the aircraft and, and really increased situational awareness for the crews. So all of our Little Bird fleet will be recapped in the next seven years. All of our MH-47G fleet will be recapped in the next seven years and we'll have a recapped MH-60 fleet. Uh, we're closely collaborating with the Army on future vertical lift. And then we're also looking at the right investments to make in lethality and survivability. Uh, the, the soft mission set requires additional investment in those capabilities. We're looking at specific con ops and specific things that would drive us to invest in, in survivability and lethality, and we're absolutely collaborating with the Army on that as well. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll close and I'll say that uh, that collaboration, number one, with the Army is, is part of the reason we can, we can do things with a little bit of speed and agility down at SOCOM. We take a certain amount of risk in the, in the new capabilities we put on the aircraft, but we could not do that without a base capability that the Army provides us. All right, Ryan Coyle, and I'm the uh, Tickham for Aviation Brigades. So everybody does always make this, the joke how much is in the portfolio, but it is, it is pretty broad. But there's also some opportunities there too. So it's aircraft survivability equipment, which you know, includes both the detect and defeat side. Um, just to talk about some of those, those things that we were definitely pursuing, and you know, it's hand in hand with Colonel Lee and his team, but um, you know, one of those areas in the, is in the radar frequency realm, and you know, all those industry partners that are 
that are here, they know that, and I think we are definitely making efforts in bridging uh, that gap. And then we've, we've definitely done well, I think, in what will be fielded in the near future with regards to IR and some of those threats that are out there. Um, on the aviation mission command and interoperability side, really the network and the radios, we all recognize that the Army um, is moving out on figuring out what that future waveform is, how we'll all talk, but ultimately for us, really air ground operations and how we're going to support those soldiers on the ground. So I'll definitely address any questions uh, concerning that. Then it gets into the aviation logistics side. So anything that's not specific to a platform that one of these gentlemen over here would handle comes into the uh, Tickham Aviation Brigade's realm. Um, then we also handle the air traffic services piece, so any of those components out there that facilitate providing air traffic services, whether tactical or fixed base. Um, and then also kind of the last piece is really what the air crew wears to include NVGs. So that, that's everything that's in the portfolio, so there's plenty of opportunity to ask questions. Um, two additional initiatives that I'll just kind of mention that I think are very important things that we're pursuing. So it's unique that ASE, to include DVE, plus the, uh, the mission command side of it, that they are all linked within Tickham Aviation Brigades. Because when you hear senior leaders talk about the ability to sense, to see, to share, to then target, um, it, it kind of does bring everything into that, you know, into that realm. Um, and it's really important how we link all those things which really then drives us to another initiative that I think it's across both PEO Aviation and at, uh, at Fort Rucker is really how do we start to leverage open systems architecture so we can rapidly infuse both advancements in hardware and in software to make sure we keep pace with the enemy. And, and you can easily say just inside ASC and the communications realm, there's, there's opportunities there that everyone out here is working on. And just linking that a little bit better will truly allow us to keep pace with the enemy and not, not kind of seed an advantage where, where we're fielding things possibly a little bit behind or, or with, as the enemies field them, you know, much more advantageous to, to leverage an advantage against them. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of leave that there as the, as the open systems architecture piece and then I'll pass it off to Colonel Lee. Thanks, Ryan. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, name is uh, Colonel Zhang Lee, PMASC. Uh, the ASC of today is, uh, is definitely uh, um, imp um, improved as well as improving uh, from the last four years and on to the, uh, in the future. Some of the things that we're working on right now is multi-spectral. Uh, as Colonel Kuo mentioned about, the, we have to keep pace of the threat, so we're working very closely with the intel community to understand the threats to truly understand the threats, not only from the actual proliferation, but also from the technical aspect. So we work very closely with the various different uh, communities, uh, both the US as well as the overseas, to take advantage of those opportunities to make sure that we're able to learn from not only the current systems, but also potential uh, systems that are out there. Uh, with that, the ASC systems, we're doing a lot of modifications, improvements, uh, starting from the missile warning system. We're going from CMOS, a UV-based uh, sensor uh, missile warning system to LIMOS, which is a limited interim missile warning QRC that takes from the, 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 the previous 10 years ago technology to today's technology, and then working closely with Fort Rucker to the future uh, missile warning system, which is the advanced threat detection system. As uh, far as the, uh, the laser countermeasure system, we're going from ATURCOM, which is a larger system that's supposed to be for, that's designed for the CH-47s, but now we're miniaturizing that technology for the rest of the fleet, and that's the uh, Common Infrared Countermeasure, Kirkham, and that will be going through a production decision this, uh, this coming summer, uh, as well as the RF side, not only the going from the analog receiver to a digital receiver, but also taking and looking into potential jamming capacity uh, and working closely with uh, EW folks and understanding the technologies, but also opportunities in the future. Uh, one thing that um, Colonel Cole mentioned about was the open systems architecture. We embraced it. Uh, we're taking that to the next level forward from the ASC perspective because we cannot continue to be always bringing down the aircraft and modifying the aircraft and then, and then modifying it again and again. So what we're doing right now, particularly for the LIMOS, 
is we're using the CMOS system, laying the fiber on top of that, uh, one to two weeks of uh, mod time, replacing the sensor with a new sensor, replacing the um, processor with a new processor, and essentially minimizing the touch points on the aircraft. Uh, so typically, a lot of these mods take five, six, seven, eight, nine weeks, minimizing that down to one to two weeks with very uh, quick uh, re uh, replacement on the LRUs. So we're going from today's technology as well as not only the, the, the power the um, R&D aspect, but also taking it to the next level on um, reducing burden on the units. Uh, with that, uh, I'll leave it back to um, General Davis for Q&A. Okay, we're, uh, so three points, maybe even four points. Uh, first point is they've got a hard stop at uh, 13, 14, quarter, yeah, quarter, yeah, Colonel Cody says quarter after, but anyway, so about a half an hour from now. Uh, second point is we're a bit out of sequence when we did this last year. So General Todd, Program Executive Officer for Aviation, is here, uh, and he speaks tomorrow, okay, in terms of his portfolio. That's point two. Now, I'm, I'm up to three points. I can't even remember. But anyway, the next point is because I have the moderator's privilege, I get to throw the first question out, but I would be uh, interested to know kind of your perspectives on how we're progressing on the man done man teaming Peace. So first. <laughs> That's so easy. I'm going to give it to Colonel Cody. Okay. So uh, thank thank you for the softball. Uh, we're progressing um, fairly well on man and man teaming. So if you if you look all the way back to 2007 and even pre 2007, uh, we had man and man teaming going on between our unmanned aircraft systems and our attack helicopters. Uh, and I will tell you that from then until now, man and unmanned teaming is far more of a technique than it is a technology. Uh, you know, I remember a, a certain colonel from a certain wolf pack taking off from a FOB uh, at Spiker and heading down south when the 1st Cavalry Division was fighting a battle uh, one night down in Bakaba. That was a pretty rough fight. Uh, there were multiple engagements with uh, anti-Iraqi forces uh, on both our U.S. troops and our coalition troops that were down there and also the Iraqi police going on all over the town. And one young, uh, one young fires officer had a shadow overhead and he was talking voice to those aircraft as they came inbound on the target and he was handing targets off. He'd hand the target off, the Apache would punch a grid in, acquire the target visually, and they would engage those enemy forces that were there. Uh, as soon as he got eyes on that target and was handed off positive ID and hostile intent of that target, the shadow went to the next target and to the next target. And they repeated that uh, over the course of a bag of gas and eliminated 45 insurgents from the battlefield in less than an hour. Uh, and that was some very powerful stuff. And they did that without the benefit of the technology that we have today. So as the technology improves today, uh, what you'll see now is you have feeds in the cockpit of your attack helicopters. You have telemetric data that comes from the UAS or the platform that's communicating with that aircraft to that aircraft. If he'd had those things back in that time period, he could have exponentially sped up the prosecution of those engagements and you know, eliminated a lot of those problems a lot faster and kept our guys safer on the battlefield. Um, we have technology to this point now that's been tested with OSRVTs and some future capabilities for the Apache and MUMTX that through some of, the, uh, some of the communications methods that we have can work 180 kilometers away from an Apache showing a feed to an OSRVT on the ground. Uh, so that is accelerating our capability to be able to prosecute those engagements and to share that situational understanding with those platforms. Uh, so that is one capability that we have coming this way, and uh, I think you're going to see a lot more growth in that. Would you like to? So I, I think as, as Paul has articulated, we, we pretty much established we can integrate uh, man to man teaming that technology into our TTPs, and we begin to evolve those TTPs. I think where we need to start pressing the envelope now is how is the autonomous battle space going to look? because manned unmanned teaming is not just an unmanned aircraft system and an H-64 Apache. Manned unmanned teaming crosses that entire spectrum. As I, I said whenever I introduced myself, we deliver capability at Echelon. 
what are those autonomous things that we need to be delivering at Echelon, and how do we connect them all to make the warfighter more effective in the battle space across their operational footprint. So it's linking everything from a small UAS, ground robotics, common controllers, common apertures, common sight picture, all the way up to echelons above division and strategic and national assets. How do people uh, be cooperative in the battle space? What are the rules of the road, the doctrine that's going to dictate how we operate and what are the expectations and how do we enable that soldier at echelon in order to be able to deliver and meet those capabilities? All right, with, with that, I'll, we'll open up. Jen, you can't be the first one to ask the question. Oh, okay, you are the first. I knew, I knew it was gonna happen for three years in a row. I think it's more like five. <laughs> um, so you mentioned, sorry, uh, Colonel Shepard, um, that the Apache Echo Model uh, FOT&E is uh, delayed by a year. Um, I obviously just wrote a story about um, some issues with the Apache Echo Model and the Strat Pack Nut um, and not accepting Apaches from Boeing. Um, is that one of the reasons that this is being slowed down or can you elaborate on what the reason is for um, delaying it by a year? Uh, no, it's not connected. No, we, we weren't we weren't ready to go to, to uh, operational test at the time period that we were supposed to be ready, and uh, or, or I will say it was it was more higher risk than it needed to be to, to have a successful OT. So uh, we've we've uh, gone gone back to work uh, with Boeing to ensure success this next time around, and we're just able to uh, gain some efficiencies with with JAGM. Uh, and do the OT at the same time. Uh, right now, the schedule's aligned pretty nicely for that, and we'll minimize touches to Forcecom and, uh, and, and save some resources as well, but it's not connected. Um, just through, the, th <laughs> through the, 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 the test phase, we just weren't seeing some of the, the satisfaction that we, we, would, we would need at the time we needed to see it. Hi, uh, James Drew from Aviation Week. I have uh, two kind of similar, kind of aligned questions. Uh, one's on the man done man teaming uh, with the Apache. Do you, do you think this uh, new system that you've got going on with the Apache and the and the Shadow and uh, the Grey Eagle has eliminated the need for a armed aerial scout in the future, uh, a manned armed aerial scout or even an optionally piloted one? Um, is, is it working that well? And secondly, there was a, uh, a new uh, future unmanned aircraft system come up in the uh, budget recently. I know it might not be fully defined, but uh, you guys as the program people, uh, what are you thinking when you think about future, um, uh, future unmanned aircraft? Can you repeat that second one? Because we had a hard time hearing you. Your uh, microphone was moving FTUAS is what he asked, but we can certainly defer the questions till the next panel, which is for FEL. Uh, for that, so if we, you, will you be here for the next panel? So the next panel is constructed of the the, the TICM for FEL, as well as the program manager for FEL. So that question may be a better one for them. My name is Shay Davis. I'm with Chemion Service Technology, and uh, you guys mentioned the overall and improvements of like the Apaches, bringing them back in and, and upgrading them. Uh, have you guys made any considerations on uh, making the pretreatments to those surfaces, you know, the aluminum and everything before you paint, more environmentally friendly, non-toxic? Because currently, right now, most of the Army uses a toxic pretreatment which is hazardous to your soldiers, to the mechanics, anyone who's doing it. Is there any considerations where you guys are saying, mandating to the OEMs and whatnot to force them or ask them to become more environmentally conscious? Uh, absolutely, yes. We have a corrosion preventative plan um, where our aircraft operate. And since uh, some, some areas are severe coastal climates or defined as within 30 nautical miles of salt water, so we're certainly cognizant of that and, and work with the OEM on, on limiting uh, corrosion as best we can.
Hi there. Warren Elworth, uh, JHNA. A question for the panel. Uh, what is our plan to prevail in the face of threats like Pantsir S1? Hey, uh, which hold on a second. Hold, I, we really, uh, there, we got the whole room back behind us speaking, so it would help us out a little bit if you would speak up whenever you're asking the question. We're having a difficult time hearing you. Yeah, the question is, Pantsir, Pantsir S1, representative of the current state-of-the-art threat, what is our plan to prevail in the face of Pantsir S1? Okay. Warren, I'll, I'll take it for a sec, but it, you know that's a huge question, right, everybody? And we don't want to, to get into the classified realm, but I think we look at it and where where are our current gaps? We mentioned some of that, and really you're you're speaking to, you know, A2 AD, so that anti-access aerial denial, but really that that IADS portion of it, that integrated air defense piece. But so, what are those capabilities we have now that allow us to operate in that environment, and where are some of those? those gaps that we're, we're, still, um, we're still mitigating. So ultimately it's you know, supporting, supporting elements across the spectrum to create it. So Paul and you know, they, they talked about uh, longer range fires. That's one thing that will give us that range that we need so we can stay out of that red zone for some of those systems. Not, not specific to one, but, but the farther our standoff, the more capability to destroy those entities. I think you can kind of even see it when the Army says, hey, we're going to pursue long-range precision fires is one of our most important, i.e. the number one CFT, right? Because if we, like what I mentioned earlier, if we can see, you know, if we can sense it, we can see it, we can share it, ultimately those long-range precision fires, you know, will, will be an asset that can, you know, destroy, neutralize, or, or at least mitigate that target. And then I think more for in here in this room, when we really talk aircraft specific, if you want to talk the RF environment, um, we've acknowledged that we have our, our older system out there that has capability, but there's also limitations associated with it. We will field a, a DV2 detection uh, program or record that will start to bring some of those uh, capabilities in the detection realm even more online. And then a future program um, is really MRWR, so on the, on the detect piece then acknowledging that part of uh, operating in a, in a radar environment is also those expendables associated with defeating that threat. We've proven that our current expendables have uh, extremely positive capability against certain threats, um, but acknowledges that some of, the newer, uh, some of the newer threats, not as much. So in that realm, we're pursuing those uh, expendable programs and then also really looking at uh, where there's opportunities to integrate uh, RF countermeasures into, you know, into what we provide to our aircraft too. So I mean, you know, keeping it at kind of the unclassified level, those are all those components we look at. And then ultimately, if, you know, if we did a, a, a con op on a whiteboard, you would also see where, you know, enablers our kind of place, whether it's a payload on a UAS, a payload on some type of joint fixed wing platform, um, but how those would also support the ability to operate in that environment. Um, I hope that was specific enough. And I don't know if anybody wants to add anything. Hello, nice to see you guys up there. Hi, my name's Jen Santos, I'm from Cypress International. So my question is, in the FY18 FY18 and FY19, there was $165 billion added, 80 billion in FY18, 85 billion in FY19 has been approved to go above the Budget Control Act. How is the Army Aviation getting to take benefit from that? Are there any examples and there are things that could be done to help the Army Aviation capture some of those funds? So, so I'll answer one specific example. Um, one, our, our plan for the MH-47G recapitalization effort was very deliberate with the Army to take four aircraft the first year, six aircraft the next year, eight aircraft the next year. Uh, in collaboration with the Army, a, a tiny bit of those plus up funds associated 
are associated with accelerating that effort and bringing four additional aircraft, new build forward. So that, that's one example. I'm sure there's a lot more. We also looked at other ways we could invest in rdt and &E and places in the programs that we knew we had wanted to invest in and we had plans downstream to accelerate through our strategic planning processes at SOCOM. We looked at ways to bring those left as well and bring capability in the survivability space and in degraded visual environment. And there was another great opportunity where we lashed up with the Army on degraded visual environment to, to try to downstream have a common solution, uh, at least for the in interim and the first set of aircraft that we could all learn something from sooner rather than later. I have, a, I have an example. Um, so, hi, Jan. The, um, the, the ASC portfolio has uh, really um, a significant increase in the funding profile, um, thanks to support from the Hill and, uh, and our user community. Just for example, in the last three, four years, we've increased about 70% scope uh, in, in the funding uh, in ASC portfolio. But one specific example you, um, related to your question is the interim um, missile warning system. Uh, we've added uh, $30.9 million this year. Uh, thanks to the uh, support from the Hill. So those are the things that very specific example I can provide is that this um, QRC that, that we have, that we got support, uh, very, very um, robust example of uh, funding this year. Good afternoon, Jen. I, I think from a UAS perspective, I think it's extremely important that we, we leverage the, the resources that we have to continue to fill out the UAS formations, make sure that the formations have all the equipment that they're intended to have to meet our Army acquisition objectives, so all the formations are fully equipped with the full complement of the equipment that they should have had uh, from the start. So I think step one is that. And then filling out those formations and continue to leverage um, dollars that we can garner to increase the lethality uh, in terms of increasing the sensors, the, the quality of the sensors, i.e. the sensor on the shadow system, as well as address some of the reliability issues that are on the platforms. Uh, as far as Apache, we were uh, we plussed up in 18 for uh, 17 additional new build aircraft, which uh, really would, would uh, uh, ease some of the burden of inducting aircraft, having to take aircraft from the field to go to the induction line. So that, that was a, a near term for us. That was uh, goodness for the program. Time for just one more question. Uh, Sharon, Sergeant First Class with uh, one six cab out of Fort Riley. This isn't uh, for the Apache side, really for the UAS side. I had two questions specifically. One. Uh, you mentioned experimental BCT UAS that was possibly coming out. I heard rumblings of it from Textron as well. Uh, the other question is, has there been a question brought up about missile defense for UAS? Doesn't matter if it, I mean, specifically Shadow and Gray Eagle. And that's my only half. So the answer to the second question is no. Um, with regard to the first question uh, with the BCT UAS. So when we, uh, for the past few years, and, uh, and also when we were here at Quad A last year, we talked about uh, a demand signal from the force for a different tactical UAS or a different type of tactical UAS. Uh, that demand signal came forward in the form of several urgent operational need statements or really operational need statements from the units. Uh, they wanted something that was point takeoff and landing capable or runway independent, whatever your definition of that is, uh, was survivable, uh, was more mobile and more deployable than what we currently had, uh, did not take up uh, a runway that could be used for follow-on air lands and things like that that could come in and, uh, and could possibly be armed. So, so, you know, they wanted everything that the shadow would do, but in a smaller package that was point takeoff and landing capable. And for us, that you should be able to share that feed across the force so that everybody had situational understanding. Uh, so if you've ever been to an AUVSI UAS event, you walk through that auditorium and there will be hundreds of variants of UAS that are point takeoff and landing capable. But everything that we looked at for a few years for a commercial off the shelf solution was always missing some key part of that capability. 
If it would take off and land, it would only have the power to do it for five minutes vertically. Or it wouldn't have an encrypted link, encrypted data link, encrypted control link. So there was some shortfall in what we currently had. But the demand signal still remains for that, you know, if you want to call it group two sized UAS for a BCT to be able to use. Um, so without digging too deep into the CFT, I recommend you, you have them bring that up a little or maybe start that with a little on the next one. Um, you know, there is consideration for an experiment uh, for some BCTs to put some of these commercial off the shelf systems into the BCTs uh, as an experiment to see how well they work and whether there's something that could, you know, address that need. That's something completely different from an advanced UAS that would partner with an FBL and do advanced teaming so that it could be part of that lethality strategy so that it could sense, see, identify, geolocate, share, target and kill something that would prevent your aviation from maneuvering through the battle space in a peer environment. But this is something that a BCT could use in something less than that peer environment that would be more survivable, that really scratched the itch without the big you know, load that goes along behind it. And I'll leave it to uh, the CFT for FVL to talk about if there's a timeline associated with that and any more of the details that are along with that. You all are off the hook now. I, I want to thank them personally for all their great leadership. They, I think you all know they've got big, heavy rucksacks in a very tough environment. So again, thanks so much leaders for all your time. And, uh, and for what you're doing. So please give them a big hand as they get to their next meeting.